Good morning, everyone. It's great to see y'all. Let's stand up and worship the Lord together. Great is your faithfulness, O God. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people. Your children, remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Great is your love and justice, God of Jacob. You use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in the song of your salvation. And all your people sing along. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. Yeah, your grace is enough. Heaven reaches out to us. Your grace is enough for me. God, I sing your grace is enough. And I'm covered in your love. Is enough for me, for me. Now, with me for prayer, won't you? Father, be lifted up in our eyes this morning, we pray. Make it possible for us to block out other distractions and to be able to fully imbibe of the fact that Jesus Christ has died for our sins and we stand before you complete in him. Thank you for bringing us here for this time of worship. We pray that we may indeed worship you in spirit and in truth today. We pray, Father, that the songs we sing, we may be able to sing as our testimony, as our praise, as our thanks to you. In the study of your word today, we pray that it will come clear to us and we will do all that it asks of us. We pray that today our fellowship will be filled with the presence of your spirit and that there will just be a richness in everything that we do today that will honor and magnify you. But we do pray that you'll be lifted up in our eyes today. And to that end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Before you're seated, greet the worshipers around you. Welcome one another. Okay, thank you. If you'll be seated now, that would be great. Well, thank you for coming and including this as your uh, Sunday uh, activity to join us in worship today here at Grace Bible Church. And um, we're uh, grateful that you've come to this church and um, going to spend this time with us. Uh, if you're here for the very first time, we'd like to welcome you specially. And um, we'd like to do that by asking you, if you don't mind, if you wouldn't take one of the cards out of the back of the chair in front of you or get a hold of one of these before you leave today and give us the information about yourself on there so we'll have a chance to contact you and get to know you a little bit better. On the back side, remember, there's a place here for prayer needs. If you have something you'd like for the elders or for all of the church to be praying about, write those out and make sure you put those cards in the basket in the back or give it to me after the service and We'll make sure that we join with you in praying about whatever those needs might be. As you came in, you got a bulletin like this, and it's got some information in there, and I'll let you read about those uh, things mostly on there. Just wanted to remind you, uh, how many of you forgot that 9.15 was the new starting time? No, don't raise your hands, okay? But for our Bible study time, we've added 15 minutes, and uh, so now we've got a full hour for our Sunday morning Bible studies, and uh, that's going to be a great benefit, I'm sure. So uh, be sure and make a note of that if you forgot this week to come at 9.15. And you can read about the other things that are listed there because there's a number of Bible studies and things of that nature and places for you to find a place of service or a group to join and become a part of that fellowship group, that care group. And uh, you can try out any of those. Just see the listing at the bottom of the page and contact those people and they'll tell you the place to meet and uh, we'll gladly welcome you to become part of that care group. Let's join again then in singing to our Lord, shall we? Stand together.
Kids can be dismissed for Kids Church.
Let's bow and ask God to bless our time of looking at his word now. Father, thank you for your scriptures, perfect in every way and um, perfect today in guiding us in things we need to know and to consider well regarding things that are necessary for us to engage in in order to walk with you, to know the fellowship and the intimacy that you desire us to have with you. And so, as we look at a text that was directed to a church that was struggling with that, help us to see it today as our own, our own struggle, our own instruction, and our own uh, admonition, and our own encouragement to do what we need to do in order to have the walk with you you desire. And so, um, open our eyes then, again, as we start uh, digging into this text of 1 John, and uh, Teach us from it everything that uh, you would like for us to know and to do today. And we'll praise you and we'll thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. I thought we'd begin today a little bit differently. I wanted to include you in being part of presenting the sermon today. And we'll do that by asking that we'll read the text of Scripture together. So if you have a bulletin, you have a half sheet in there that has the text that we're going to be looking at. And so if you can find that and take that out, and when you do, let's stand together and let's read 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 through chapter 2 and verse 2. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness... We lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous, so that he will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Thank you. You may be seated. You know, whenever we start studying a book of the Bible or a new letter, as we're doing right now with 1 John, there are several things that we ought to note as we begin to dig into the text. And these are some things that I've been beginning to share with you since the very beginning of this study. One of the things that's important for us to know, if we can possibly do so, is who the writer was. And that's not always possible with every book of the Bible because the writers don't always identify themselves. And this book does us no favors because the writer doesn't identify himself. Uh, But I've assured you that it is the Apostle John. Uh, The early church had an overwhelming agreement that it was John who wrote this letter that we're beginning to study. Something else that uh, you also should note is who the audience was. Uh, Who was he writing to? That will often tip our hand as to what the significance is of what he says in the letter. And it will also provide us some points of contact for what he would say to us as well. Well, once again, he doesn't identify exactly who the readers of this letter were intended to be. But after the end of the book of Acts, as we noted earlier, John spent a great deal of time ministering at the church in Ephesus. And so there is, again, strong, strong evidence that this letter was written primarily to the church at Ephesus. Whether we got all that right or not, though, we do want to make sure that we dig into the text and see if we can identify why the guy wrote the letter to begin with. What were the issues at hand? Was he trying to correct something, encourage them in something, help them in some particular way? And we can do that very easily when we read 1 John Because one of the things that we'll see throughout this letter is that this was a church that had been invaded by false teaching and false teachers. If you have your Bible open, you can see some quick references to that. 
and the warning he gives about beware of the false teaching and the false teachers. Chapter 2, verse 26, for example. These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. Chapter 3, verse 7. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteous is righteous just as he is righteous. Chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, every teacher, every person who proclaims that he is representing God, but test the spirits to see whether they are actually from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And so you can see that this is a letter that's largely concerned with the false teaching that is in the church. It's not a tax on the church on the outside that John is concerned about, but about people who have come in professing to be believers who have had a great deal of influence. They've participated in the church. They have taken part in ministries. They've given money. They've been friendly and nice and all of those things, but they've brought with them a great deal of teaching, which is not true. And as we work our way through the letter, we're going to, we're going to see that that teaching affected everything from God to Christ to salvation. And today, the next topic that he takes up to the subject of Sin, the subject of sin. John had taught this church well, no doubt. They had been building on a solid foundation while he was the minister there. But now things were beginning to drift, and new ideas were being promoted about these types of things. And if we don't get these basic things right, the church will soon be off base in more ways than we can possibly count. And so today, we're going to take a look then at uh, some things that John has to say about getting the subject of sin right from a biblical perspective. And he's going to identify for us in chapter 1 three erroneous views of sin that had taken root in the church before finally in the last two verses that we read, presenting what I would call the committed Christian's understanding of sin, what they had been taught and what we need to embrace in order to be people who are true followers of Jesus Christ. First, before we look at the three erroneous views of sin that he presents in chapter 1, let's look at verse 5 because uh, this gives us the basis for why this topic is so important. Why does it matter what we believe about sin? We all have an idea that sin's probably bad, right? But what is the significance of that when it comes to a person's relationship to God and being a follower of Jesus Christ? And John summarizes very simply in verse 5 why this is so significant. Let me read to you. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And so the first thing he wants to assert as he begins to talk about why the subject of sin is so significant, why we need to get that right, is because when it comes to God, God has a zero-tolerance policy toward sin, no matter where it is found, whether out in the world among those who do not know him, but also in your life and in mine. He has a zero-tolerance for sin. Notice the language he uses here to describe God. And he begins by describing God as light, as light. That's a common way that God reveals himself in Scripture as one who dwells in or is represented well by light, by light. Remember uh, Moses back in Exodus chapter 33? He asked God if he could see him. He says, show me your glory. And God said, you can't see my glory because it will consume you. The brilliance of who I am will cause you to die, but I'll do this for you. I'll put you in the cleft of the rock, and there, while you're not able to look on me, I will pass by, and you'll be able to see the back of my glory, as it were, not looking directly upon me, but seeing the brilliance of the light of my glory as to who I am. Many other times in Scripture, we find God represented by light, and other writers representing God as light. David, in Psalm 27.1, used that image to describe God when he said, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Or I like something that Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 6:16. 6, he dwells in unapproachable light. 
And on and on we could go with many, many times how the Scripture uses the metaphor of light to describe God. Well, what does light convey about God anyway? Well, it conveys purity. It conveys holiness. It conveys um, truth. It conveys the absence of evil. It conveys the presence of everything that is good and right and just. It conveys all those attributes that we studied just a few weeks ago. That is all conveyed by the idea of God being light, being described as light. And John, notice how he does, he goes then the other direction by just emphasizing the point by saying in him there is no darkness at all. By the way, you, if you're familiar with John's writings, you know that this is one of his favorite metaphors, light and darkness, light and darkness. Light for what is right and godly, darkness for what is sinful and just the opposite and not acceptable in the eyes of God. But he says there is no darkness to be found. And he says it emphatically, at all, at all. The translators didn't just throw that word in there. It is there in the Greek text, and it's there for emphasis. There's no evil. There's no deception. There's nothing in God that is wrong. There's nothing in God that is lacking. There is no darkness in God at all. And we would add that when we talk about God's light and being light and being, having no darkness in him, if we look through the scriptures, we see that also means that when God's plan for the ages is ended, we discover that God has no tolerance then for darkness around him at all, for sin around him at all. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 7 makes the statement that there is no need for the sun in heaven because God himself is the light that lights the place. It's a perfect place where there will be no more sin, no more evil, no more violence, no more fraud, no more evil or sin of any kind. And the implication of it all is that God has a zero tolerance policy for sin. Were it not for Jesus Christ, we would be in a whole world of trouble, were we not? Because Jesus is the one who takes care of our sin problem, our darkness problem, by paying for our sins and then transferring his righteousness to us so that we can exist forever in the presence of Almighty God. Well, this is where John starts when he wants to talk about the subject of sin. And by starting here, he's making that emphatic point that it's important to God, so it ought to be important to us to talk about sin. And so he next gives us three erroneous views of what had invaded the church with regards to sin. Here's the first of those views. Um, it's what I'm going to call the carnal Christian view, the carnal Christian view. And, and by the way, as we're working through this, I want us to understand something. Because usually when we think about sin, those of us who are in a Bible church, you know, we think about going out there and getting those people who are lost in their trespasses and sins. And I want us to remember something. As John is writing here, his primary concern is not with them, but with us, those of us who know Christ, and with the sin that it finds expression and is welcomed sometimes into our own lives and our need to deal with that. And so keep that in mind as we work through this. But one of the false teachings is the carnal Christian view, which is the view that basically says, let's not get all worked up about this too much, okay? Um, as one uh, armchair theologian put it, many people believe that um, God's attitude toward it is, is, uh, is, I'm a sinner and God understands. And he really doesn't think too badly of us because he knows that we can't help it because we're sinners. But this is a view that's very dangerous because, well, it takes sin and uh, doesn't deal with it, and it takes uh, personal holiness way too lightly, way too lightly. It's trying to live the double life spiritually, of saying, on the one hand, I have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, but on the other hand, I'm still full-fledged a participant in the world as I was before I came to know him. Look at how he addresses this in verses 6 and 7. Verse 6 begins, 
If we say that we have fellowship or intimacy with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Now, while we were reading earlier, maybe something you may also have noted as we were going through the text, it's always important to look at sentence structures and keywords and all that sort of thing. You may have noticed all these verses begin with if. If we say, if we walk, verse 7. If we say, verse 8. If we confess, verse 9. If we say, verse 10. Conditional sentences. Conditional sentence. If you say this, if we do this, then this is what naturally follows. There's a condition that's presented and then something else follows. And three times in this opening section of verses, he says, if we say. And those three times identified the three erroneous views about sin. Because there were some who were saying this, and then we'll see there's some who were saying number two, and there were some who were saying number three, the three erroneous views. And so this first view is one that basically says, I've trusted Christ and my relationship with God is perfectly fine and I know I'm going to heaven and isn't that the important thing? And yes, that's all great stuff, isn't it? We need to make sure of that, that we're trusting in Jesus Christ alone as our personal Lord and Savior. But that's not where it ends here. If we say we have fellowship with him, it's not just that we know we're going to heaven but are we walking with him? And he says, if we say we're walking with him, if we say we have that relationship with him, and yet at the same time we're walking in darkness, there's the other half of the condition. If we say we have a relationship with God, and yet there's stuff in our lives that we know shouldn't be there, then notice what his assessment is. What does he say in the next part of the verse? We lie. We lie and do not practice the truth. Now, when he says we lie, he's not saying we're lying about whether we're on our way to heaven or not. Have you ever um, grasped the fact that as Christians, we can do horrible things? We can do as horrible, as horrible things as can be found in anybody who does not know Christ. We're capable of that. The lie is not about whether we're saved or not. The lie is about saying we have intimacy with God, that we're walking with God, that I'm aware of the presence of God, that I feel the power of God. I have the peace and the strength of God. I have the resources of God, saying that everything is okay between me and God when there's darkness in my life, when there's sin in my life. That person's a liar. That person is a liar, he says, and he does not practice the truth does not practice the truth remember Jesus used to emphasize that when people came to him and wanted to turn to him and trust in him as he did with the woman at the well in John chapter 8 remember what he said the last thing he said to her after he forgave her he said go and what sin no more sin no more uh, Paul wrote something really similar in um, this regard in um, Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6 and uh, verses 12 through 14 where he uh, exhorted the believers in the church at Rome, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts and do not go on presenting the members of your body as, to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law but under grace. We are to be people who are at war with sin, with getting sin out of our lives. And that's John's point here in verse 6. We can't say that we have fellowship with God if we are gawking at pornography on the internet when nobody else is around. We can't say that we have intimacy with God if the way that we speak, James 3 talks a lot about our tongues and the way we speak, if our language is not different from that of the world, whether in terms of honesty or in terms of cursing and swearing or expressions that shouldn't fall from the lips of a believer. 
We can't say that we are uh, intimate with God if we have an addiction to alcohol or to drugs or to some other thing that nobody else knows about. We can't say that we have intimacy with God when we're involved in immoral relationships, when we can't decide or whether we have made a decision that there is a gender identity crisis in me and I have to be something other than what God created me to be gender-wise. We can't say we have intimacy with God when there are things found in our lives that should not be there. That's James's point, or John's point. Now, something I like what he does, though, is look what he does next, because uh, at least for these first two uh, wrong views, erroneous views about sin, he goes to the other extreme, and he says, okay, now suppose I've convinced you. Uh, what do I need to do? What do I need to know next? Well, look at verse 7. Verse 7 says this. Here's the conclusion. Let's start walking in the light, and this is how he says it. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, okay, we're going to come out of the darkness, and we're going to acknowledge that these things are there, and, and we're going to do the necessary uh, you know, examination of ourselves, or we're going to let somebody who loves us and knows us well who's a believer criticize us constructively and help us along in our growth in Christ. If we're going to start doing that, if we're going to walk in the light as he himself is in the light, uh, notice what he says is going to happen. First of all, we're going to have fellowship, full fellowship with one another. But notice this, the blood of Jesus Christ that has cleansed us from the penalty of sin now is going to cleanse us from the power of sin. He will come with his resources to enable us to overcome those things that need to be overcome. And we can have healthy relationships then with God and with one another. We can have true relationships with one another. With no hidden agendas, with no hidden behaviors, everything just clear and honest and right up front. Well, John takes up a second false view of sin in the next couple of verses, which I'm going to call the, the confused Christian view, the confused Christian view. And in verse 8, notice once again, he begins by, if we say, so there are some in the church, apparently, who have bought into what's going to be said next year. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. This one's a different false view than the one that we have just looked at. You know, that first one is denied the seriousness of sin. You know, we don't want to deal with things maybe because we don't think they're that bad. Um, this one's going to deal with the very presence of sin in our lives. And there's going to be a, a denial now that now that I have been saved or now that I have been enlightened spiritually, that uh, I don't really even have the capacity to sin anymore. Now, if you want to wonder how that could possibly happen in that particular context, a couple of weeks ago I mentioned to you that these false teachers came in, and we don't know for sure who all they were, and, but there's a strong belief among Bible scholars that uh, one very influential group was a group that came to be known as the Gnostics, the Gnostics, and that starts with G-N-O-S-T-I-C-S, the Gnostics. Uh, the Gnostics were a, a spiritual group that invaded the church. Uh, that word Gnostic comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge, and what the Gnostics taught is that if you really want to know a spiritual life, if you really want to know an afterlife that is just mm, out of this world, if you want to really, really have the best that could possibly be given to you in the afterlife, then just open yourself up to spiritual gnosis that God will give people who feel that way. Now, how that happens and and, uh, you know, how you get that, I mean, is uh, anybody's best guess. There was no uh, certain way to do that. Um, but just if you really wanted it, that God would, would pour into you this spiritual gnosis and, and you would become enlightened. And from that point at which you became enlightened, you would no longer be capable of sinning. Poof, it's gone. You wouldn't be capable of sinning anymore. Um, Wow, what, a, what an idea, huh? Um, you know, there are people walking around who um, even today believe that they're not capable of sinning. Or they look at the things that they do in their lives and, you know, there's, uh, oh, there's always a good explanation as to why I did that and that 
took away the idea that there's any guilt or sin associated with it. Um, the reason I said that is because, well, I was prompted to say that, and it's really what I should have done, even though from a biblical perspective we shouldn't have done that. There are people who, who, who actually believe that, actually believe that. But look at what John's response is to that kind of thinking. If we say that we are that way, we have no sin, we are what? Deceiving ourselves. Deceiving ourselves. And the truth is not in us. The truth is not in us. Um, anybody here bold enough and, you know, rough enough and uh, righteous enough to say hey, you don't struggle with sin? <laughs> No, I know, but you recognize as I do, it's a battle, isn't it? It's a battle. We don't reach a state in this life of sinlessness. It's a war. And that's what John wants his people to know. It's always going to be there. Always going to be there. And, and the Bible reinforces that in many, many ways. Um, the Old Testament has a great verse in Ecclesiastes Ecclesiastes 7.20 says, Indeed, there is not a righteous man on the earth who continually does good and who never sins. Who never sins. Or how about uh, Paul's New Testament expression of that in uh, Romans chapter 3 and uh, verses 10 through 12. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God all have turned aside together. They have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. He's talking about us. He's talking about us. Or how about his own personal struggle that he wrote about in Romans chapter 7? This is a chapter that's caused so many scholars to stumble because they say, Paul, this great Christian, this righteous man, this church planter, this evangelist, this guy who counsels and pastors and does all the right things, uh, surely he couldn't have been talking about how he was as a believer. This surely must have happened, what he described here, when he was an unbeliever. But I don't believe that. I believe we just take it in the context of the flow of Romans. Listen to what he said about his own personal struggle. And I'll just pick a few verses out of here. 7, uh, 15, for what I am doing, I do not understand, for I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I'm doing the very thing I hate. Or how about a few verses later, verses 18 and 19, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want, and he keeps going on and on like that until he finally says about himself, wretched man that I am, when will I be set free from this thing called sin in my life? Of course, he does give the great answer that it's through Jesus Christ. And someday when we stand in his presence, it'll all be taken care of and it'll all be expelled and we'll be sin free. But not this side of heaven. But not this side of heaven. That's the, the issue. By the way, does this um, belief that we are basically good people exist today? Some of you are smiling because the question is so ridiculous, isn't it? Do we really believe that in our world that what we're seeing is people who are basically good to the core? And the answer is no, we don't, do we? If that were true, why do I have locks on my door at my house? Or a security system. Why do I have to have that if people are basically good? Or um, why uh, do we have security cameras? Or why do people here in East Texas, I've never been in a place like this, but why do people here in East Texas, so many of you carry handguns if people are basically good? I have a pastor friend, by the way, who carries a handgun in his coat pocket every Sunday that he preaches. And... Um, I asked him why. He says, because people are evil. <laughs> he said, it doesn't have anything to do with how people are responding to my sermons, but people are bad. <laughs> I think that um, the most ridiculous fundamental lie of the woke movement is that um, people are all victims. It's somebody else's fault that I'm not making it better in life. 
it's not my fault because of bad choices or because of bad thinking or bad ideas in me. It's somebody else's fault. And so we have to adopt the woke movement so we can make all these bad people, and I guess I'm one of them, uh, stop being uh, the kind of guy that makes everybody else a victim who has not had the good fortune that, uh, that I've had. Uh, the confused Christian view, the confused Christian view. But go back to what John says, because for the second time, he gives uh, some good instruction here about uh, uh, when we wake up to the idea that we are sinners and we're constantly having the struggle with sin and we're often failing in our efforts to live righteously. Verse 9, if we then will confess our sins, if we'll own up to the fact that we're sinners. And that word confess basically means that. It means to say the same thing as somebody else. Homologeo, it means to say the same thing as somebody else. And the somebody else he's talking about is to say the same thing that God says about it. And what does God say about it? I love you with an everlasting love and I'm going to save you, but I saved you as a sinner. And guess what? You're still a sinner. If we confess our sins, if we can say the same thing that God says about it, then watch this. He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When it says that he's faithful, it's reflecting the fact that he's promised forgiveness. If you turn to my son, guess what you'll find? Forgiveness. He's promised forgiveness. He's faithful to what he says he will do. And so there's forgiveness to be found. And, uh, and he's righteous. He's able to do what he says he will do. God never makes a promise that he is incapable of fulfilling. He's faithful and he's righteous. And notice what it does. It results in his forgiving us and cleansing us from unrighteousness so that we can be set on the right path again of walking in the light, walking with him. Which brings us to a third erroneous view of sin. Verse 10, I call this one the counterfeit Christian view, the counterfeit Christian view. Uh, this is the one time I guess maybe I'll have to step outside of what I said to you earlier about what God is, uh, or what John is saying, and he's speaking to Christians and so forth. But there are people in the church about whom this is true as well in that church at Ephesus. If we say that we have not sinned, if we say we have not sinned, if we say we have not sinned, that means we've never done anything bad enough to have to ask God for forgiveness. We've never sinned. We've never done anything serious enough to offend God to the degree that he would say you can't come to heaven. If we say that we have not sinned, then this is the most serious one of all because look at what the rest of the verse says, how he assesses that person. That person makes him a liar. Who? God, his son, Jesus Christ, makes him a liar, and his word is not in us. You know what that would say to our theology? That would say that everything we believe about Jesus Christ is a lie. When the angel told Joseph to name the child Jesus, which means the Lord saves, because he would save his people from their sins, it's a lie. It's a lie. Or when Jesus, in the course of his ministry in Matthew 20, 28, said that um, the Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many to set people free from the penalty of their sins. It's a lie. Jesus was a liar. John 19, 30, when Jesus on the cross, just moments before he breathed his last, said, it is finished. It is finished. The payment for sin has been made. And what I'm doing here on this cross, it's a lie. It's a lie. All of it's lies. That's why I say this one's the most serious one of all. And it causes me to look at this person and to say, he's a counterfeit Christian. He does all the right things outwardly. He goes to church. He gives money. He participates in things. But as far as having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, it doesn't exist. He's never come to grips with the depth of his sin, he's never come to the place where he's put faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone and received the gift 
of eternal life. You know, the prevailing view of natural man is what? We don't need a Savior. We'll save ourselves. We'll save ourselves. You know, we see this great, vast ecological preservation movement going on right now. We're going to be a green America. We're going to be a green world. We're going to save ourselves. We'll take care of everything, given enough time, and if we'll just get everybody thinking the right way. Have electric cars instead of gas-powered cars. Get rid of fossil fuels. Get rid of all this idea that um, uh, this victim mentality stuff and get everybody thinking the right way that, um, you know, we are all equal and, uh, and all deserve better and so forth. We'll save ourselves. And John begs to say differently, though. He begs to say differently. We can't save ourselves because we're going to do better. We can't save ourselves because we'll try harder. We can't save ourselves because we'll be smarter and we'll make wiser choices. We'll not save ourselves. The person says he has not sinned, that he hasn't done anything that bad, makes God out to be a liar and desperately needs to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Well, there's one more view of sin that um, I want to deal with quickly, and that's in the first two verses of uh, chapter 2. Um, we've seen the three erroneous views. Chapter 2 really kind of brings us back then to what is the committed Christian view? What is the committed Christian view? And um, this one is uh, simply put that I am nothing more than a sinner saved by grace. And I don't care where you put that statement at your life, wherever you, however old you are, how long you've known Christ or whatever, that's something you can always say about yourself. I was looking at um, an old friend's uh, Facebook page the other day. Um, sometimes I look to see what people have said about themselves, where they have, you put all that information in there, and, and she had written in there under religion, because a lot of people put Baptist, Protestant, Catholic, whatever. She wrote, sinner saved by grace. Sinners saved by grace. That's who we are. That's uh, who we were one moment after we trusted Christ. That's who we are today. We're still sinners. We still need God's grace. We still need it at work in us. And that's kind of where I want to guide our thinking as I look at what John writes in those first two verses of chapter 2. My little children, remember this is his term of affection that he uses over and over for them. He calls them children, not insulting them because they're immature or anything like that. No, it's really just a term of affection. I love you like a father loves these children. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And by the way, this is something you're going to see John always doing. He's not just getting... He's not always concerned with just saying, do you believe? Do you believe? He's concerned with practicing the truth, with living out your belief, with living in a way that shows that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And he does it right here. Uh, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but for those of the whole world. Jump to verse 2 very quickly because Jesus Christ is the focus, right, in all of this. He's the key. He's the one that we have to know if we're going to experience forgiveness, if we're going to experience intimacy with God. And in verse 2, he calls Jesus a propitiation. What in the world is a propitiation anyway? <laughs> well, in the secular world, a propitiation was, if it was between two people, it was what one person did to make another person who was upset with them not be upset with them anymore. You know, you gave them money or you apologized or whatever it was, but a propitiation was something that you did to make them like you again or to be in right relationship with you again. And when it was used with reference to the gods, it meant doing something to appease a god who was angry at you in the secular world. But here it's applied by John to our relationship with the living and true God when he says that and reminds us here that Jesus that, that, that God has this no tolerance policy towards sin well how do we deal with that <laughs> we don't but Jesus Christ did God hates sin God has wrath towards sin but what Jesus Christ did on the cross 
appeased the wrath. It removed the wrath and instead moved us into the realm of being the objects of God's love. Isn't that great? Phenomenal stuff, isn't it? Unbelievable stuff. Unbelievable stuff. Jesus did what was necessary for us to have a relationship with God. And then we can scroll back up then to verse 1, to the effect that has on us and what John's talking about here. Um, If we sin, well, of course we do, that same Jesus is our advocate, our counsel for the defense, our defender, the one who comes to speak for us. If uh, Satan, and he does, stands there and says, there's a sinner, there's a sinner. And Jesus says, yeah, but he's my sinner. I've saved him. He belongs to me now. I died for him. And he's trusted me for eternal salvation. We're sinners. We're sinners saved by grace. Sinners saved by grace because of what Jesus Christ has done. Let me give you two takeaways for the end of this all. And um, one is simply to remember that uh, the salvation issue has been settled once and for all through what Jesus did and on that day that we put our faith and our trust in him as our personal Lord and Savior. Case closed. It's done. Penalty for sin has been paid. We're on our way to heaven. Nothing's going to stop that. But on this matter of dealing with sin in our lives after we have been saved, well, that's going to be an ongoing battle for the rest of our days. Until we're in the presence of the Lord, that's going to be a fight. It's going to be a fight mentally. It's going to be a fight physically. It's going to be a fight emotionally. It's going to be a fight spiritually. It's going to be a fight relationally. It's going to be a fight in every way, in every way. But what John says right here is we hold the key to the victory if we know Jesus Christ is our personal Lord and Savior. And we'll learn to turn to him, confessing our sins and remembering that he paid for them and remembering that he brought into our lives that day the resources to deal with them. On that basis, we can be victors each time this thing comes up, and it will come up again and again and again. What about you today? Have you settled the issue about trusting Christ as your personal Savior? Is there still some doubt there? Are you still some unresolved questions you have there? Or can you today just say, I know he's the Son of God. I know he died on the cross. I know that's the only payment that can be made for my sins, and I'm trusting in that. Have you resolved that issue? Are you doing that? If not, you can do it right here, right now. Or if you want to talk about it afterwards to have any other questions you might have, be glad to meet with you. Be glad to talk with you. All of us who have trusted Christ as Savior, well, We need to be people now who are kind of um, doing a little bit of uh, checking into our lives to see that we haven't just come to accept ourselves totally as we are, as if now, okay, now I'm finished and I have nothing to work on. No, now you're in a dogfight. Now you're in a war to become what Christ wants us to be. But he's there as our advocate to stand with us whenever we take that posture and whenever we attack those things. He will bring the resources necessary for us to overcome them. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for letting us look at these things. I pray that we would not take lightly the seriousness of the subject of sin in our lives. It's there. It needs to be dealt with. It will keep raising its ugly head more times than we can count. But thank you for a passage of scripture like this which tells us that there is an answer for all of this, an answer that will enable us to succeed and to walk in the light, to leave the darkness of whatever that is behind and to walk in the light. And so for that, we pray and trust you right now in Jesus' name, amen.
y'all would be seated for just another moment. We have one other important thing to take care of today. Uh, we have a family that's leaving us. And uh, we're leaving, uh, leaving us with joy, though. Uh, Ed and Mary Quillen. I don't know, Mary still may be coming to serve on the worship team, so okay. But Ed Quillen, you and Mary, come on down here. Tell us what you're going to be doing, where you're going. And uh, as they're talking, Larry and um, Garrett, in just a moment when they, he gets done talking, we'll... Um, We'll proceed. Do you want a microphone here? I know. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll just talk loud. Uh, so, uh, some of you know, back in June and July, uh, I was asked to, to bring the, the 
Sunday morning message at Mesquite Bible Church five Sundays there. Uh, their pastor, my friend from seminary days, Todd Justice, uh, had resigned back on the first Sunday of May. And uh, so now the church uh, has asked me if I might step in for a while, uh, hopefully it's a short time, to be their interim pastor. And, and I've accepted that. Uh, and so I'll be, I'll be doing Sunday morning services over there until, until the Lord brings to whoever the, the future pastor of the church is. And, uh, and, and just doing pastoral care, uh, you know, the church has only had two pastors in 45 years, and so they're, they're hurting. And uh, so just, just pastoral care, loving the flock, of, the flock of God, as the Bible says. So we'd appreciate your prayers uh, from, from Mary and I. And I'll also be helping uh, as an advisor on the church team, an advisor to the, the, the two elders uh, of the church. And, uh, and we have an outreach team also. I'll try to fit in on that because uh, I, I have a real heart for lost people. So uh, uh, appreciate your prayers uh, for us. And the days ahead. Okay. And, and Mary will be here a lot more Sundays than I will be. Okay. <laughs> well, if you would stand closer together, let everybody know you love each other. Okay. <laughs> Garrett, if you would come stand on one side. Where's Larry? Here's Larry. Okay. And we want to pray for them. And this, I guess, is our means of just kind of commissioning you and telling you thank you for playing the cajon and uh, for preaching here and, and your Garrett ministry here. <laughs> Sometimes he needs another harmony singer. Yeah, so. Step up. Okay. Well, let's bow together and let's pray for them, shall we? Father, we do thank you today for uh, the way that you uh, use us for your glory and uh, put us in positions where we can serve you. What a, what a great privilege. Uh, what a great opportunity now that uh, stretches before Ed and Mary and uh, especially Ed as he's going to be speaking each week and serving in the various capacities at Mesquite Bible. Um, Father, we thank you for his ministry here and um, all he has meant to us uh, these many months. And uh, we just pray now that you'll take these skills that you've given him and use them mightily there for the accomplishment of what needs to be done there. Uh, we thank you also for Mary's uh, worship team work here and um, for the time she'll still continue to serve with us. And we, uh, we just appreciate and love this gifted couple, Lord. And um, how you brought them here and now move them uh, to do other things as well. And so as best we know how, we send them off now with uh, your blessing, your grace, and uh, ask, Father, for your best for them and everything that they will face and they will undertake. And to these ends, we will pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, we'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> and we are dismissed, so be sure and... Give Ed especially a hug before you leave because we may not see him for a little bit. <laughs>